to pull out the worship and prayer guidelines sheet that you were handed at the front. We're just going to go right into it for time's sake. If you can just read along. If you don't have one, maybe you can share one with the person next to you. So there's a scripture at the top, and it says, Whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. I'm just going to read through this together. We believe that God has a master plan for revival in San Francisco. Let's agree with the mind of Christ as he is ahead of the body. Do we actually believe that? Okay, good. So he doesn't really need our help in a sense, right? We actually need his help because he has a plan, right? That's a good way to look at it, I think. Sometimes we think we can help God, but actually (laughs) he wants us to serve him. He has a plan. He has a plan. For who has understood the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. That's something to really get in our understanding. And that's something I want to also ask us. Do you believe that you have the mind of Christ? Sometimes we have to quiet our own mind, right? To be able to enter into the mind of Christ. He said to them, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer. This is what Jesus said, that his house, his church, his people, what our main stage, our MO should be, is a house of prayer as a priority. The Love SF Firebase is an environment where people from all Bible-believing congregations can gather in unity to pray and worship in the freedom that Jesus purchased for us at the cross. We have an open mic format in our prayer gatherings, and you'll see once we get the 24-7 part going, you'll see how we flow with that. We explained it a little bit here, but it's, it's almost better to be immersed in it. We have an open mic format, so please honor the body of Christ by keeping your time short on the microphone, two minutes or less, or if no microphones are necessary for some of the late night watches, please be considerate of the length of your prayers so that others can participate as well. We have believers from different cultures, ministry backgrounds, styles of worship, and behavioral expectations all in one room. We want to serve those in the body of Christ with love. As such, we desire to govern our worship and prayer times by exercising our Christian freedom with a little restraint. We do so by limiting personal freedom so everyone can easily connect with the Lord in prayer. We ask that you honor these guidelines as we seek the Lord in prayer and worship together. And then I just kind of lay out a couple basics here, just to make it clear what this gathering is about. It's about seeking God's face. That's what it's about. That's the, the, the main function of this fire base during this week, that our prayer would be more about seeking his face than prayer points and prayer agendas. We're open to people praying for whatever the Spirit puts on their heart, but we want the priority to be falling in love with God, (laughs) staying in that place of the first and greatest commandment. What it is about, it's about praise. It's about thanksgiving. It's about celebration, right? Is he not worthy of that? But Jesus died on a cross and destroyed the works of darkness. And he rose from the dead triumphantly. And he's given us all things with Christ Jesus in eternal glory and blessing and favor forevermore. Shouldn't we look a little excited? Shouldn't, you know what I mean? Maybe a little more excited than we already look at on, on services on Sunday morning. I mean, I don't know about your service, but I think my Sunday morning service could look a little more excited sometimes. For those of you who go to my church, I, I'm not saying anything to, you know, keep us down. I'm, I'm trying to encourage us to press in a little bit more because we can get a little bit more excited for Jesus. And guess what? It's okay. It's actually biblical. And we left a bunch of scriptures there just in case you weren't sure. So you can uh, check the scriptures for yourself. But you can celebrate the Lord in this place. What this gathering is about, it's about unity that brings breakthrough. Okay, we want to pray prayers of unity. That's a prayer theme that we really have a heart for. Now, it, it, we're not going to force you to pray prayers of unity, but we're highly encouraging it. And there's a lot of scriptures in the Word that talk about Christian unity and how powerful that is when the saints come together and agree and believe together. The promise of God that's on that is so powerful and dynamic, and very seldomly do we access the full benefits of unity in the church. This gathering is not about, okay, let's talk about what it's not about. 
It's not about self-promotion, okay? So we don't want people coming up here with an agenda, <laughs> you, know, t- you know, pumping their name and their ministry, you know, and, you know, having the whole meeting turn to them. We want this to be about Jesus. It's not about religious or political agendas or affiliations. We really want to be careful with that. You can pray for those in authority, like the Bible says. You can just pray biblical prayers about you know, government officials and government leaders, but if your prayer is turning into a dissertation on your stance politically, and you're just kind of like praying it through the side of your neck to <laughs> let people know your political opinions and, and, and strong-arming them to agree with you, that's happened at lots of prayer meetings I've been to, by the way. We don't do that here. For the sake of unity, it's just totally unwise. You know, all of us have political opinions in this room. That's fine. You're welcome to those. You know, I celebrate your freedom to choose. But in this prayer gathering, we want to pray biblical prayers for those in authority, and that is perfectly fine to do. We believe that every member of the body has a prayer, a praise, or a word. Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice, and they follow me. It's time for us to act as the royal priesthood that God intends us to be, releasing his kingdom with authority. Do you believe you're the royal priesthood? You have a great privilege. You have great authority. You are his sheep. And because of that, the scripture teaches you hear his voice. You may not be an office prophet, okay? But you hear his voice in a measure. So as a people of God, we are a prophetic people. We are prophetic people. And we can grow in the gifts, the Bible says. It actually says to earnestly desire spiritual gifts, especially prophecy. So we should grow in the ability to hear from God. But I want you to know there's an entry level for every Christian (laughs) ability to hear in a measure from the Lord, enough to pray his heart, enough to be a royal priesthood that's effective to bring change and to bring his kingdom to a city and a region. And then at the end of it, it says on the first page, but all things should be done decently and in order, okay? We want order in this house because we have these different streams. There will be Baptists. There will be Pentecostals. There will be Charismatics. There will be conservative evangelicals all coming together, different ethnic churches with different styles. And for their sake, we want to make sure that we're all doing things biblically and orderly without quenching the Spirit. Who can do that? God can do that, right? Thank you, Jesus. You're going to help us. Okay. So on the back, let's flip it over. It says mouth. We're just going to get real, <laughs> real blunt. Mouth, okay? This is what you do with your mouth. To maintain an atmosphere of prayer and worship, we ask that all conversations be kept to 10 to 15 seconds. Longer conversations should be taken outside the prayer room. That makes sense, right? Personal volume should not exceed the, the worship or prayer leader volume. Hi, Jeff. I'm just, <laughs> I'm teasing you. <laughs> I love you, man. <laughs> no. You, you are anointed, brother. He's amazing. I love your volume, by the way. When singing or praying, adjust your volume so that it does not become a distraction to people around you. Okay? No food is allowed. No drinks are allowed. But you can have water. You can have a bottle of waters in the prayer room. The fellowship hall downstairs is perfectly fine to eat if you need a little snack in between prayer watches. Please use a container with a lid. Praying in tongues. Okay? Praying in tongues quietly to yourself is permitted, okay? In a corporate setting with mixed company, if you do not have an interpretation the Bible teaches, Bible teaches, not Adam Hood, not Love SF, okay? I I personally believe in the gift of tongues. I have the gift of tongues. But for the sake of my other brothers and sisters from other denominations, I will pray under my breath. Unless... I have an interpretation. And so I say that for all of you. We don't forbid tongues here. We just want to do it very orderly and very biblically. Okay, prophecy. Prophecy is a gift of the Spirit of God. The Word tells us to test everything, so we're going to test prophecy. It's okay if you get a word, but there will be leaders during each watch, just overseers, to make sure that the Word of God lines up. If you have a prophetic word and you believe it is for corporate release. Think of corporate release. We're not giving personal words. Then expect this word to be tested for its alignment with the written word of God. Your prophetic word should be for the corporate body or to advance the kingdom of God. This is not a time for personal prophecy, okay? So if you get a word for someone in the audience, this is what I suggest. Go up to them alone 
you know, you can pull them outside if you think it's going to be a long conversation and share the word with them. I'm not going to forbid getting a personal prophetic word for someone, but from this microphone and from this altar, we want to keep it corporate and we want to keep it kingdom. Okay, so let's do hands. Okay, hands. What do we do with our hands? Okay, raising hands is allowed. You won't get in trouble for raising your hand. <laughs> we don't want anyone to get in trouble. We're just being silly right now. But clapping is allowed. We, we gave Lord a, a big hand clap of praise, and he's so worthy. For safety reasons, though, we're asking, please do not use any implements or props, for example, flags, banners, sticks, swords, etc. When it gets crowded in here, let me just tell you, I know swords. It's happened. It has happened. That's why we developed this. We've learned. <laughs> we've learned over the years. There has been some liability. So we've learned how to nip that in the bud. And uh, I'm not against banners. I'm not against flags in general. But when you have a, a, a packed out room and a lot of people in very little space, we've had people poked in the eye. We've had people really hurt. Um, it's caused problems. Just and, and, and for the sake of unity, it's just easier if we just... Yeah, we're going to do flags out on the streets. Oh, yes, we are. And, and we'll connect you with that outreach right after this. Please do not play any musical instruments outside of the musicians in the prayer room. For example, tambourines, shofars, drums, etc. However, if the worship leader invites the room to join in with extra instruments, then it will be permitted. So if you're leading a watch and you bring all these instruments, and you're like, hey, everybody, grab an instrument. That's up to you. That's your two hours. You get to, you know, we, we release that as freedom. But for other people taking watches it's become a problem if you just start to interject yourself without their agreement. When praying for the sick or doing any type of ministry that is initiated from the prayer or worship leader, we encourage you to stand in front of the person you are praying for, if able. Please lay your hands only on their shoulders, arms, or head, and keep your hands still. This is funny. No rubbing. <laughs> the, it, it, it's funny, but you actually have to say it because people get weirded out. You start to rub their shoulders sometimes. So um, even if your heart's totally in the right place, it's just better. Keep your hands still. There may be limited exceptions to this. For example, laying your hand on someone's ankle to pray for healing, but permission to do so must be received from the person you're praying for, okay? Feet. Shoes may be removed. We prefer that socks be worn. Some people go barefoot. We're not going to make it a, a serious rule. Just, you know, we're just trying to be respectful of this house and, you know, different streams that are coming in and through. No running, please. Please refrain from dancing. That would take you out of your personal worship space. You can dance. You can dance. But we've been, we've had groups during the prayer times when there's a lot of people in the room and they're like going back and forth and through the crowd and people are getting knocked out. <laughs> and uh, so we've seen that. So uh, these are just basic prayer guidelines, okay? But I want dance because the Bible says to dance. It teaches in the Psalms to dance to the Lord. So that's a biblical expression of worship, okay? So I'm going to go right into the prayer teaching because I have, it looks like I have about a 35 minutes max, and this is about an hour teaching. So I'm going to turn it into this hour teaching in the 35 <laughs> minutes in the name of Jesus. Okay, thank you, Lord. First of all, I just want to share a scripture, one of the most quoted scriptures in the Bible about prayer. Okay, and it's Second Chronicles 7.14. I'm sure most of you have heard that verse <laughs> quoted in a prayer gathering before, maybe many times over, okay? But I want to camp out in this one phrase within that passage, okay? So Second Chronicles 7.14 is, if my people who are called by my name would humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, forgive their sin, and heal their land, okay? We, we all believe this. But there's something that God really highlighted to me and to us in this movement. It's the seek my face part of that passage. And, you know, that preceded turning from their wicked ways. You know, we can't even turn from our wicked ways without coming to the Lord, beholding his beauty and his glory, waiting in his presence. Then he pours out conviction. He pours out his spirit and grace to get free from whatever may be hindering us. So that's what we want to do. We want to seek his face. It also says, if my people, 
What does that mean? It doesn't say if my person. So it's a corporate call. So when we quote this scripture, we need to remember this is a corporate call, and it's a corporate call to action and prayer. And, and, and the, the emphasis of the prayer, and I believe the first and greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God, right? With all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. So it's okay to camp out at seeking his face. It really is. Actually, God wants you to seek his face. He likes looking at your face. He really does. He's in love with you, and he wants you to be in love with him again. So let's camp out at seeking his face a lot, a lot. He'll inhabit that place. He'll change the atmosphere. He'll impart wisdom and grace to his church. He'll shake everything which can be shaken. We must be crucified so we can truly follow him on his terms in prayer. See, Jesus is also known as the chief intercessor, right? He is a chief intercessor. He has a plan in prayer. Did you know that? He knows what to do in prayer. And he says, my sheep hear my voice and they follow me. But how do we enter into that? We can't enter into it if we have all these plans before we even come to the meeting. We have to be crucified. We have to come humble like one of these little children. If you can't receive the kingdom like these little children, you can't receive the kingdom at all, he says. We need to come expectant, dependent on him. Come fresh every single day. Holy are you, Lord. Give us this day our daily bread, not yearly bread. He gives us revelation day by day. He gives us freshness day by day. He'll give us a word for a season. He will. He'll give us a word for a whole year sometimes. But the way that plays out is we have to seek him every day for revelation on that word that he gave us for that year. See what I'm saying? So we're going to come to him with a fresh heart of faith, believing that God has a plan. And if I get out of the way, then I can access his plan. Part of God's plan with prayer is this. He said, my house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations. But what has happened? He said, you've made it a den of thieves. What was he talking about? What was, what was a thievery that was happening at the time? There was money lenders, money changers. There were all these um, pigeons they were selling and, and things that were between the altar of God and the people of God. And they had to go through these people and pay money in order to be able to commune and have fellowship with God. But this is when Jesus got really, really angry and got violent. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm gar I guarantee you Jesus wasn't worried about the shekels in the temple. He's rich. He's very rich. He's not worried about some, some chump change in the temple. But what they were robbing God of was intimacy. They were robbing God through dead religion, through extra hoops, unnecessary hoops. They're in the way. Drive it out now. Get it out now. I don't even have time. I, Jesus is like, I wish I had a whip. I got to make one right now because I'm so mad. Where's my whip? Oh, I'll, mm, get out now. That was the love of God in action in that moment. He hates dead religion. He hates extra hoops for people to have to jump through to commune and meet with God when he made a way, when he is the way. Come to me, all who are heavy laden and burdened, not just Christians. All come to me. Let's make it easy for people to enter in. Yes, God's a God of order. But if that order is hindering people from connecting with God, that we need to get it out of our hearts. We need to get it out of the house of God. In Haggai, it teaches, in Haggai 2, and I'm going to, for time's sake, just, you know, sum it up. Why do you build your own paneled houses while mine lays desolate? Build a house that pleases God, that I may take pleasure in it. This is what the scripture says. And it says at the end of Haggai that he will shake everything which can be shaken, that if the people of God were to build a house that pleases him, that he would shake everything which could be shaken. And he'd fill this house with glory. And the latter glory will be greater than the former glory. The Lord really spoke to me out of the book of Haggai years ago when he called me to prayer. I was doing a fashion arts ministry. We were in, getting in magazines and newspapers. We had some, you know, favor. It seemed really cool. And, uh, but the Lord said, I don't need your help. He said, I need you to die. And he brought me through a really intense sifting and testing in a cross season. And he called me 
with this word from the book of Haggai. And he said, why do you all run to your own ministries? Why do you all run to your own paneled houses, your own brand name ministry, your, your self-promoting? Why are you running down that road? Why are you thinking you can help me do anything when you need my help for everything? I need you to die so you can actually start to serve me now. So the Lord had to strip me of everything. And he called me back to the city, and he said, this is what I want you to do. I want you to build a house that pleases me. And it's a house of prayer for all peoples. For some people? No, for all people. So that they can come and meet with me. So that they can come and worship me. The promise is so large. If we could see this together as one city, if we could see ourselves as a citywide church, that each one of us has an offering to bring to this vision of a house of prayer for all nations, we could have one central location. Maybe they'll be in a few places because we have a, a lot of people in the city and there's different languages. But that we would get a continual offering of worship and praise and prayer to God established. There are enough congregations in this city. There are enough believers in the city where we could get an on earth as it is in heaven reality springing up. By the way, what's happening in heaven right now? The 24 elders, the four living creatures, they are casting their crowns before the Lord. They're crying out with a loud voice. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and who is and who is to come. The whole earth is filled with your glory. And they never stop crying praise to God. And Jesus said to pray on earth. How? As it is where? In heaven. He never ceases to be praised. Never. And it says night and day they praise him. So why don't we praise him night and day? We go to our church services I love my church service, don't get me wrong. I'm plugged in at my church. I love my church. I'm a member at my church. But we do our three songs. Then we go to an offering. <laughs> then we go to the message. And we have our schedule. And, and when the schedule's done, then God has to be done too because we all have to go. You know what I mean? It's kind of like, what about the tabernacle of David? David raised up 24-7 prayer and praise and worship. And he kept it going. And it says in Amos 9-11 that in the last days that the tents that have fallen down, the tabernacle of David will be raised up again as it was. How many houses of prayer are happening now all over the world? Thousands. How about 20 years ago? Just a few. Something's going on on planet Earth right now. I'll tell you what. God is stirring it up. He's stirring up his people. This is unto the end times harvest and the return of the Lord. Isn't this exciting to be alive right now? It's really awesome. So we need to light this up on earth as it is in heaven. Even in the Old Testament, it says the fire shall never go out before the presence of the Lord, day or night. What do you think that was a picture of? Just lighting a candle in front of the Lord? It was a picture of the people of God burning before him consistently, constantly. I really believe that together as a church, we can get this thing going in San Francisco. We can get 24-7 worship and praise and adoration and communion and fellowship with the corporate body of Christ, all bringing their offering to the citywide altar unto the Lord. What do you think will happen when we do that? The Bible says good stuff. That's a good answer. Good stuff. That's for sure good stuff because he inhabits the praises of his people. You know, the tabernacle of David was a lot of praise, you guys. It was a lot of praise. It, it was some prayer, but it was a lot of praise. You know, back then, the Jewish mindset was not to presume upon God. He knows everything. They would intercede as things were necessary to intercede for, the sins of the people. But they would praise him and praise him and praise him. And, and prayer is important, don't get me wrong but it really should be motivated by the presence and the unction of the Holy Spirit in an atmosphere of continual praise and worship. The Bible says he is great and greatly to be praised. 
you know, how loud are the Giants praised in San Francisco? I mean, when the Giants won here, I was in my neighborhood, the Portola District, and it's, it, you know, we're, we're near Bayview, Hunters Point. There's, it's, it's, there's a, a rough element where I live, okay? But there were shouts, screams, horns honking, gunshots. I mean, I was out prayer walking. I mean, I chose the wrong time to prayer walk. <laughs> maybe it was the right time. I don't know. But it's an illustration now, so maybe that's why God wanted me to do it, because the praise that went up for the giants, you could hear all over San Francisco. It was roaring in the city, roaring in every neighborhood for hours, for hours. I mean, I have never heard the Lord praise like that. I've never heard the Lord praise like that. Imagine what would happen if the church started praising the Lord like the unbelievers praise the giants in this city. <laughs> Some believers, too. Some believers praise the giants more than they praise Jesus. They'll get louder for the giants than they will for Jesus. They'll have more joy for the giants than they will for Jesus. We need to rise above. It needs to be on earth as it is in heaven. It's high praises. It's vibrant. It's with a loud voice. And you can praise God in your heart and be fervent too. Don't get me wrong now. Everyone has to cry out all the time. There's a biblical precedence for contemplative prayer and, and, and quiet prayers as well. And just coming and beating your chest before the Lord. That's good. Don't get me wrong. But be wholehearted. Be wholehearted as you're engaging with God. I want to talk about unity as well and the power in unity. Psalm 133 has a promise in it. Psalm 133, we love that verse. You know, how good and how pleasant it is to, when brothers dwell together in unity. Yeah. It talks about, it, it, it's like the oil that pours down upon the head of Aaron all the way down to the hem of his garment. I'm paraphrasing a little bit for time's sake. But Aaron's a picture of the high priest. And the oil is a picture of the Holy Spirit being poured out. And when we come together in unity as the saints, in worship and praise and in prayer, now we're in that high priestly place in the spirit. And God begins to pour out his oil, and he begins to break things. What is the promise at the end of Psalm 133? In that place, I will command the blessing, even salvation even salvation. You want to see salvation in San Francisco? That we need to come together as one, as that royal priesthood, like Aaron with the oil pouring down all over him to the hem of his garment, that God would come and bring that breaker anointing for San Francisco through our unity. In the upper room, they were in one place and in one accord, and then what happened? And then suddenly, but what did he say to them? When you come into this upper room, he said, wait for me. Wait for me in Jerusalem. He didn't say pray against the sex trafficking that was no doubt happening in Jerusalem at the time. He didn't say pray against the homosexuality that was no doubt happening in Jerusalem. Sometimes there are these buzz kind of trend prayer points that will take the whole church in that direction, and we're focusing so much on these kind of current um, focuses of ministry and those things are good to pray into. Don't get me wrong. Please don't get me wrong. I pray against sex trafficking. I pray for freedom for people that are bound in, in that, that life choice. I pray for those who are bound in homosexuality. I came out of homosexuality. But what I really feel like God is saying is, wait for me. Wait for me. Because you don't even know how to pray correctly about this yet. And honestly, if you would just wait for me, I would shake it anyways. I'm going to shake it. I'll shake everything which can be shaken. I'll bring in that harvest more than you ever could with your lofty prayers. Make it about me, and I will show up and change the atmosphere. The importance of being one. Jesus prayed it before he went to the cross. He said, Father, may they be one as we are one. As we are one. Jesus said that. For then the world will know, John 17, 21, for then the world will know and the world will believe. That's exciting. When we're one as he is one, what was that place of oneness that they had? It was intimacy. 
It was a constant fellowship and communion. He was always aware of the presence of the Father. He was always communing and listening and hearing. And Jesus said, I do nothing except what I see the Father doing. John 5, 19, I do nothing except what I see the Father doing. And he said, follow me. So shouldn't we also be doing nothing but what we see the Father doing? Shouldn't we also be one as he is one? Shouldn't that be such a priority for us as a church? When it's his, one of his last prayers he prayed before he went to the cross? I think it's pretty important to God that we start to unite together, that we start to become one as he is one. We've brought an accusation against the gospel, you guys, through our disunity. We really have as a church. And I just hope that we can repent and return to the Lord on his terms according to scripture, if my people. You're right. And, and I, I speak of it in this way. It's a holistic gospel. It's not just going out and preaching to the pre-believers. I like to call them pre-believers. <laughs> pre -be let's speak life. Pre-believers, please, Lord. They are lost souls. And they're lost without God. And it's, it's a terrifying reality without Jesus. And it's eternal. It's serious. But God wishes that none would perish, but that all would come to repentance, that all would come to salvation. This is his desire more than it is ours, actually. So if we can mix that with faith. And if we could be a holistic witness in the city of San Francisco or in the city where you're from, some of you are from different cities, could you imagine if the church rose up, started uniting together, started loving each other, started working together for the sake of laboring and prayer and worship as a foundational priority of church function, that that became more important to us than the, the show on Sunday, okay? If we could start to reform the way we do church, to line up a little bit more with Scripture, maybe we could nudge each other a little closer each day. That's what I feel like God is saying. He loves his church. He's working with his church. He wants us to do it together. And he's patient, right? He's patient. The Bible says, I am patient, long-suffering, not willing that any would perish. He's talking about us. He doesn't want us to perish. God's going to come with his full manifest presence. He wants to pour out his spirit. But remember what happened to Jerusalem when they weren't ready for the day of visitation? What did he say? He judged them that day. He said, I long to gather you like a hen gathers her chicks, but you would not. You did not recognize the day of your visitation. We're in a day of visitation right now. It is not time to drag our feet. It really isn't. And there is grace to come together. There is grace to come together in Jesus' name. So God is going to do this by his spirit. I've been out on the streets and people have said to me, why should I believe your gospel? You don't even believe it. These churches don't get along. You guys don't get along with each other. You're divided. And he thought he had me against the ropes, right? And I said, guess what? We're doing something called Love San Francisco right now. And we have 40 churches in orbit that come in and out. We unite together. We work together. So we're working on that. Jesus is working on that. And he, he's seen your heart cry that you want to see a true example of love. Well, it's rising up right now in the church. And the church is repenting. And I just want to repent on behalf of the church and say sorry that we've been a bad witness to you. And we haven't showed you love through our example corporately in the city by being the family of God the way we ought to have been all along. How will they know that we're his true disciples but by our love for one another? In the church, there's so much cordial love. It's so skin deep. It's so surfacy. That's not the love of God in Christ Jesus. We need to go deep with each other. We need to go deep with each other. We need to model this love. And we need to preach it too. We don't get to get out of preaching it. <laughs> we have to preach. Preach it with our lives. Preach it with our mouths. Hebrews 11:6 6 says, We must believe that he is God, and a rewarder of those who diligently seek their prayer points? Sorry, I just had to say it. <laughs> I just had to say it. Because sometimes we do that in prayer meetings. We'll seek our prayer points. But what does this say here? 
Hebrews 11, 6 says, for those who diligently seek him. When you really seek after him with all of your heart, my goodness, he's a rewarder. He starts to give you downloads of what his heart is for that city, for that region, for that time. How to really pray his heart. How to really get his mind. How to really connect with him in love. To receive his love and to release that love over a city from a place of being so loved. I, I've had Christians say to me, well, you know, I, I'm, I'm not doing this for rewards because, you know, I'm just doing it because I love Jesus. And so I tell them, you know, that's kind of unbiblical in a way. You know, I get it that you love Jesus, but Jesus says in his word <laughs> that you must believe not only that he is God, but you must believe also that he is a rewarder. I mean, you sound really good in what you're saying, kind of pious and stuff, but let's get biblical about this. God gives rewards as an incentive for us, and he intends on paying in full beyond what we could ever think, ask, or imagine according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. This is good, good news. We need to believe that he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Come expectantly when you pray. We're not just beating at the air when we come pray. We're shifting things in the heavenlies every time we come to God in prayer. And you have to believe it. You have to believe it or it won't work. Without faith, it is impossible to please him. God is the author and he is the finisher. He knows what to do. And if you're hurt, by the church. You're here and you're hurt by the church. I can't relate at all. Just kidding. <laughs> Come on. We've all been hurt by the church, haven't we? Is there anyone in this room who hasn't been hurt by the church? Raise your hand. <laughs> You've never been hurt by the church? You have? Okay. You have. Yeah, we've all been hurt by the church. So there's a, there, I have a verse for that, okay? So there's a, there's a scripture here. It's in Hebrews 13. Hebrews 13, 13. But it says that we need to follow Jesus outside the camp, bearing his reproach and offering up a continual sacrifice of praise. So if you're hurt in this room today, guess what? You have a sweet offering for the Lord. And he receives it just like that alabaster jar being broken and poured out all over him, that aroma that expensive aroma, that perfume of costly praise. It costs you to praise him right now because you're hurt. Well, guess what? Jesus can relate, but you don't have an excuse to not show up. You don't have an excuse to shut your mouth from praising him. You have an offering to God in any state of life that you're in. Praise the Lord. Psalm 24, 7 says this. Lift up your heads, O you gates, and be lifted up, you everlasting doors, and the King of glory will come in. You know what's going to reach this city, you guys? It's simple faith. It really is. It's simple faith. You know, Paul said, I fear, lest after Eve was deceived by the serpent, you too might be deceived from that sincere and pure devotion to Christ. Right? We've made it about so many things, haven't we? But the scripture is so clear about what's really important. And it's really all about him. It's really all about him. It's about simple faith. First John teaches that this is what overcomes the world. Even our faith. Wow. Wow. Guess who did it all? Jesus. Guess who said it is finished? Jesus. You know, the enemy has come in and sown a lot of distractions in the church, even in prayer. I've been in prayer meetings all over the state with all different prayer groups, and I've seen a lot of interesting things go on. I'm not going to say names. I love everyone in the church, and I believe that God wants to wake us up. He wants us to return to him. He wants us to fall in love with him again. This is the repentance I really believe ultimately that God wants the most, that we would fall in love with him as a church, so much so 
So much so that our whole body would be filled with light. I want to talk about praying the word of God. I'm going to wrap up soon. But we're in a Joel 2, 28 and 29 season. How many of you guys know what Joel 2, 28 and 29 is? I'll just tell you, just in case. It's a refresher for those who know. But it talks about in the last days that God will pour out his spirit on all flesh. On all flesh. And on sons and daughters he'll pour out prophecy. And on old men they will dream dreams. And on young men they will have visions. And on all flesh, even uh, maidservants and manservants, and, you know, they will all have revelation. All of them, from the least to the greatest. It says all flesh. And Peter said that we were in that time in the book of Acts. And he said th those were the beginning of the last days. It's been 2,000 years. We're in the last, last days. According to Scripture, we're still in the last days. But what I've noticed is this. What I've noticed is this, is that when you pray God's word and you expect him to answer that prayer and you remind him of the promise of his word, he is faithful to pour it out and to answer you with power, with power, with fruit. Remember Daniel when he prayed? He was in Babylon and he reminded the Lord. It's not like the Lord is forgetful. Okay, but he's looking for his priests to be awake to what he wants to do. Who will go for me is what the Lord says a lot in Scripture. Who will go for me? And Daniel said, I'll go for you, Lord. I'm reading in your word here that it's been 70 years. It's been 70 years. Restore our captivity. Restore our captivity. Take us back to the promised land, Lord. And he was resisted. Our prayer sometimes is temporarily resisted, right? There's spiritual battle going on. But what happened? 21 days in. 21 days of faithfulness. What happens? God breaks in. God breaks in with the breakthrough. So do not grow weary in well-doing in your prayers and in your praise and in your worship and your connection with God. For in due season you will reap if you faint not. God, keep back a spirit of fainting from your saints in this hour. So the same way Daniel reminded the Lord, we remind the Lord of Joel 2, 28 and 29. We remind the Lord. We say, Lord, you said in the last days that you're pouring out your spirit on all flesh, and you said that old men would dream dreams, and you said young men would have visions, and you said sons and daughters would prophesy, and all flesh would have revelation. And that all who call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Lord, you said you would awaken souls by your spirit. You said it. All of them would have this awakening, Lord. It's okay to remind the Lord with his own word. He likes it, actually. He's like, now you're praying. Now that's something I can get behind. Now there's some faith arising in you. And you can say, you know, enough is enough of the dead religion. Enough is enough of a fruitless prayer meeting. Let's remind God of his word. Let's mix it with faith and let's make a demand of his spirit and not faint in that place. One night we were praying here. We had an all-night prayer meeting. We were reminding God, Joel 2, 28 and 29. We're like, God, do it. Do it in our neighborhood. Do it right here in this neighborhood. And what happened was this. A woman down the street has this dream that she's not right with God. She Googles the nearest church. She ends up coming here. And this is just one story. There's been another story that happened. I was at another church, and we were praying this Joel 2:28 and 29 verse. It's not the only verse you can pray, but I'm using this as an example, okay? And we cried out to God, and we ended our time praying the Lord's Prayer at the end of our meeting. And then a week later, this young man comes into the church looking a little distraught. And I said, what brings you here? He said, well, last Friday night, I had this really terrible dream that I wasn't right with God. And I woke up praying the Lord's Prayer. <laughs> and I just came to the nearest church. Is that not a sign that God is excited about our prayers? And wanting to answer them 
even more than we want him to answer them? God wants this thing. But who will go for me? The Bible teaches to be disciplined so we can pray. I love that it says that in 1 Peter 4, 7. It says, live disciplined lives so that you can pray. It's awesome. It's just like mic drop. <laughs> that we would pray without ceasing is, is God's heart, isn't it? So we believe together that Jesus said, my house is a house of prayer for all nations. Can you just say of yourself, say, I am a house of prayer? I am a house of prayer. Do you believe that you're a house of prayer? Because you're the tabernacle of God. And together, he's building us all up as a house of prayer for all nations. And what happens when we seek his face together and his presence comes? He begins to change us and transforms us. What does it say? As we behold his glory, we're transformed, right? And the mystery of the gospel is Christ in you, the hope of glory. When you look at Christ a lot, and you get filled up with his presence, then it just pours out of you when you go out to the streets. And we're going to transition at this point. So I'm going to follow suit, and I'll go over this at the beginning. So the outreach and rules of engagement. So if you have that, pull that out. All right, so number one is participation. We ask that you would participate. I'm just going to skim through. Is that cool? Just to go a little fast. Okay. So we ask that you participate in all aspects of the outreach unless otherwise given permission by the outreach leader. So that means you're here for the full six hours if you're going on an outreach. Amen? The next thing is report times. That means be on time. We're not going to wait for you. I know it sounds a little mean. But what happens is because it's a 24-hour event, if we go over 10 minutes and then the next team goes over 10 minutes, now we're behind 20 minutes. Because they're back to back. So then we're like at the end of the week, we're behind a whole day. So we want to we stay on time and keep it on schedule. And so that's why we have a schedule. And that will be available to you after this uh, training as well. So you guys can plan out what outreaches you want to go on. Uh, the next thing is area operations. So we've uh, scouted and prayed about what areas we should go and preach the gospel at. And so we don't want anybody leaving that area without notifying their outreach leader and getting an okay from them. So that means, like, you're going to an area and you're like, oh, my grandma lives around here. I just, I'm going to go stay over at her house. You have to, if that's what you want to do, you got to tell somebody, hey, this is what I'm going to do. You know, we're responsible for you when you're on this outreach. And we don't want to be like, well, where's this person? You left with this person, outreach leader. Where's that person at? What happened to them? Does that make sense? Amen. Give me some feedback. It's a conversation. Amen. <laughs> okay, team, team configuration. We're going out in teams of two. We're not going to bunch up into like teams of five or ten because that ends up being like a very um, intimidating for uh, pre-believers. So people who haven't surrendered their life yet to Jesus. Imagine that you're sitting there, you're having some coffee. Ten people roll up on you and they're like, you need Jesus. That's not cool. You're like, whoa, what is going on? <laughs> Who are all these people, right? It's, it's intimidating. And they're like, walls are going to go up. We don't want that. We want to have a one-on-one -on -one personal conversation with somebody because that's what's going to take it that far. That's what's, what's going to allow their hearts to be open to what you're saying. So we're going in groups of twos. Unless otherwise stated, we might go into, like, some hard areas. Where we'll be like, okay, well, we got to boost up the numbers here. So, you know, we'll go in fours or however that looks like with your outreach leader. The other thing is we're going guys with guys, girls with girls. So we're not, it's not evangel date time. Amen? It's time to just go out and preach the gospel to people. There'll be people here that you'll get to know, and they're going to be amazing with the same heart that you have. But outreach time is to go out and represent Jesus. Unless you're married. If you're married, you guys can go out together, which is a cool combo, you know, because you can speak to women and you can speak to men. We also ask that you, um, you know, unless the Lord leads, that you'd speak to your own gender. So if you're a guy, speak to guys. If you're a girl, speak to girls, because it gets, it gets a little iffy, not on your part, but on theirs. I've seen it a lot. We're like, there'll be a, an awesome woman of the Lord, and she's trying to talk to a guy, and the guy's not receiving it. He's just there to try and flirt and get at you, and it's not, it's not really going anywhere, 
and it's just causing all this like weirdness and then she gets back and she's like it was just weird for me you know and she's uncomfortable and it's just so let's keep it guys with guys girls with girls the next is discipleship on mission oh something else about the the teams if you feel like you're a seasoned evangelist and that means that you are able to preach the gospel to anybody anywhere at any time if you're comfortable doing that we want you to pair up with somebody who's uncomfortable doing it. Someone who hasn't had a lot of experience. Uh, and that takes us to the next one, which is discipleship on mission. And that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to disciple others into evangelism. I know sometimes, like, we say, oh, yeah, we're going to go preach the gospel. And a lot of people get timid about that. And they're like, well, I've never done it. I don't know what to say. What if they ask you a question, you know? But... If you're with someone who's seasoned, they'll, they'll exemplify that. They'll show you how to do it. And then you'll see, whoa, this is super easy. Like, I can totally do this. And really what we say is we're just going out there to make friends. So if you can make a friend, you can go out there and preach the gospel. The next thing is encounter protocol. So if I'm out there and I start a conversation, so say I have a, a, a partner with me, right? I start a conversation with a pre-believer. My partner isn't going to start jumping in and talking to them at the same time as I'm talking to them because that makes things confusing. So I'm like here, and I'm like, hey, man, what's your story? And my friend's like, blah, blah, blah. And you're like, you know, like the person's like, what's going on? Like, who am I talking to? So the first person that talks to the pre-believer is the person that is the, the protocol leader, as it were. And if the other person wants to say something, uh, what we normally do is give them a, a signal, like touch their shoulder. And so then they'll be like, oh, okay, yeah, uh, my friend here wants to share something with you. And unless the, the leader gives you that permission, we ask that you just stay behind a little bit and just pray for the conversation. So that way we're, we're in the same spirit, we're doing the same, you know, we're, we're in unity. So that's the next one, tactical prayer leader. So at all times, let's be praying for these encounters that the Lord would just break in and open their heart to the gospel. The next one is demonic distraction. And you, you're going to see this a lot. Um, what happens is you're right at the moment, like the person's like ready to give their life to Jesus. You're like, are you sure? You know, you know the cost of following Jesus means you have to give up your life. And they're like, I'm ready, man. And you're like, okay, let's pray. Let's ask Jesus to come in your heart. And right at that moment, someone comes in. Like I seen it. Like we were out on the street here a last time for Love SF, and I'm preaching the gospel to this guy, and we're at that moment. So we're right there, right? This guy's about to receive Jesus. All of a sudden, this lady comes right in. I'm literally this close to this guy because we're having like this intense, intimate moment. And this lady comes right in between us and tries to kiss me. Her name, she said her name was Whitney Houston. So she like, she's like trying to kiss me and I'm like, whoa, what is going on right now? And this guy's like, this guy's like, wait, what? And it's just like breaks the flow, you know? Thank God my wife was there with me and she came and she grabbed her and she loved on her. She was like, hey, come talk to me. What's going on? You know what I'm saying? But it's, it happens. And so you need, you need your mission partner. So you as a mission partner, you have to be aware of what's going on. Like, this is a fight. This is a battle for souls. You think the devil's not going to do something when he sees you out there preaching the gospel? He's, he's ready. So we have to be ready. So be ready to run interference and stop that person. All of a sudden, they get a phone call, and you're just like, hey, bro. Let's, let's just stay in this moment right now. Don't worry about the phone call. This is more important. Amen? Next one is love and truth. So we preach a message of love. We preach that Jesus loves us, and, and he wants to come and have relationship with us, right? We don't come with a message of hate. We don't come with a turn or burn right? We come with a message of love, but at the same time, we don't hold back from sharing the truth. Because sharing the truth is love. But there is a sense, people out there 
who haven't surrendered their life fully to Jesus yet, they understand and they know when you're being fake. They can see right through it. So when you're out there and you're sharing this love, and out of that place of love, your heart is totally love for them, and you share the truth out of that place, trust me, no matter how hard the word you're giving is, they're going to receive it. And they're going to say, whoa, I've never felt so loved, yet so confront- confronted with the truth. And that's what we want. We don't want them to feel like rejection or you need to do this, this, and that to be right with God. No. They're sinners. So don't be shocked that they're in sin. But we're here to love and share that Jesus can bring you out of that place. Amen? Next page. Ministering with and to the opposite sex. So the same thing. We just ask that women minister to women, men to men, unless... Um, you know, unless you feel led by the Lord or, you know, it's a circumstance that leads you to do, to do otherwise. Okay, evangelism materials. We only use the evangelism materials that are given by Love SF. If you have any other evangelism materials, please do not pass those out. And if you'd like to share those with us so that we can put them on our table to pass out, we would have to review them and ask and pray and see if the Lord would have us share those. Another thing is we're not track ninjas, is what we call it, where you're just out there like, because those, those get thrown in the trash. Like, totally people get saved. Like, people get saved off of a track they found on the floor, but people really get saved, and you have a better chance when you have an encounter, like a legitimate one-on-one encounter with a person, and then you give them something. So if they have, like, an encounter with the Lord and you give them something, what happens is that thing all of a sudden represents an encounter that they've had. And so every time they see it, they remi- they're reminded of what happened, whatever that was. And that thing can preach the gospel to them even after you're gone. So we believe in tracks, but we, we don't want to just pass them out to anybody. And we don't have tons of them either. So we want to give everybody an opportunity and a chance to use them. We have amazing tracks. The next thing is authority. So we ask that you obey and submit to the authority of the outreach leader, so long as it's biblical. Amen? Because we're taking, you know, responsibility for you guys while you're out there. And sometimes we say things and we do things for a reason. So we ask that you just trust us as we do that. Uh, texting and phone calls during outreach. So we're out there to, to preach the gospel, not to be on the phone with our friends. And so we just ask that you would just manage that well. You know, if it's an emergency, totally fine. But if it's not, let's just stay focused on people. You know, let's not be like, oh, hey, man, have you heard about Jesus? And they're like, oh, yeah, well, one time you're like, oh, yeah. Or you're just like, yeah, uh-huh. Oh, that's cool, bro. You know? Let's not do that. Let's love on them. The next thing is resolving issues. If you have an issue with anybody uh, on on your outreach, please tell your outreach leader. If you have an issue with your outreach leader, my number is right there. You can call, preferably text me. Right there, Rodrigo Burgos at 818, that number. That's mine. So you can call or text me, preferably text. um, If you have any issues at all and you need some support, if you have any issues with outreach leaders, then if you have any issues with me, Adam's email is there. But that won't happen because I love you guys. The next thing is clothing. Um, we don't want to build walls because we, we want to go and, like, really connect with people. So don't wear clothes that's, like, automatically going to build a wall. So don't have a a shirt that says, I support such and such political group, because that automatically, like, it's just going to build a wall with somebody, and then they're not going to hear your heart. Then the whole time they're going to be judging you. Even even Jesus shirts sometimes, you know? You have a shirt with Jesus on it. People have misconceptions of who Jesus is. You know, my dad or my church represented him in the wrong way, so that's the way I see him, and then they won't hear your heart. So let's not do that. 
The next thing is messenger bag because we have tracks and things like that. It'd be a good idea if you had a bag to put them all in and then pass them out to keep them nice. Um, worship. Abide by the worship and prayer guidelines. Then social media. We have a hashtag. It's hashtag LoveSF247. And you can totally just go crazy and share anything and everything except for outreaches or things having to do with rainbow people. And that's what we call the LGBTQ community. And that's because it's, it's such a, a sensitive community that we don't want to expose or have them feel exposed by us. So we're not out here like, oh, we're going to go preach to this person, you know? We're not doing that. We're preaching the gospel to everybody. Everybody needs the gospel. So we ask that you just do that. Um, the last thing is the follow-up and discipleship. It's not on here, but we do have follow-up and discipleship for people that uh, receive Jesus for the first time or recommit their lives. And that follow-up and discipleship team is you. Amen? So if the Lord allows you the opportunity and and to lead somebody to the Lord, we ask that um, you would disciple that person. Because if he's giving you that opportunity to lead somebody to him, then he's also giving you the grace to disciple them. And so we just ask that you would do that, and we will facilitate that by having discipleship groups. Um, and we have cards, and they'll be at the ammo table, so where all the, all the tracks are at, there'll be these cards. And on the back, there'll be times and dates for um, groups where we're going to help you disciple that person. So we're not going to disciple them. We're going to help you disciple them. And this is just a group to help you do that. Amen? Also, um, we have a link for when you lead somebody to the Lord. It's called lovesf247 slash nb.com. And that's just new believer, so NB, new believer. And you just sign them up so we have their info so that we don't lose anybody. So maybe it's an out-of-towner and they leave and we don't want to lose that person. We want to stay in contact with them. So it'd be cool if you fill out that form online for them. The last thing is there's a thing here that needs your signature. So read over that. And then at the end, before we eat, we'll collect these and we'll give you a wristband. And that will indicate that you've gone through this training and that you say yes to what we're asking of you. Amen. All right, let's get to it. This is the fun part. I'm going to talk about um, what the gospel is. And then I'm going to share, like, practicals on how to engage somebody with the gospel. And in a, in a very simple form of the gospel. And we're going to do, like, some practice. So... We're going to practice with our neighbor and just sharing what the gospel is. All right, so I want to start off by giving you guys some scriptures. Yeah. Don't get too excited. So these scriptures, I believe, really hit the core of what the gospel is. So it would be cool if you memorize these or write these down so that you can impart them to people out on the street. We're going to be taking some notes, if that's okay. I'll give you a moment to, to grab your notes. All right, the first scripture is 2 Corinthians 8, 9. It says, You know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you by his poverty might become rich. Mark ten forty five, The Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as ransom for many. Romans 5.8, God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. 1 John 4.10, and this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. John 3.16, this is famous for a reason. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. That whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Romans 6, 23. The wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. 
Romans 8, 1. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Romans 8, 32. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, who will, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? 2 Corinthians 5.15, and he died for all, that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. And this is my favorite one, and I think it gives like a full representation of the gospel and how we can share it on the streets. 2 Corinthians 5.17-21 through 21. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we as ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us, we implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So I want you to read those and meditate on them and ask the Lord, Jesus, would you show me how to share the gospel simply through these? I want to drive three points home that I want you to remember um, about the gospel. And the first point is that the gospel is not about you. I'm sorry. It's not. The gospel is not about what man has done, what man is doing, or what man will do. The gospel is not about men. The gospel isn't even about your good works or your bad works. The gospel is about God and what he has done through Jesus. See, that's why we share the gospel because it's not about us. There's no excuse. It's not about you. There's no excuse not to share the gospel Because the gospel is not contingent on you. And there's no excuse to not receive it because it has nothing to do with you. But it's all about God. The next point is you need the gospel. I need the gospel. You need the gospel every single day. I used to be part of a ministry where you backpack across America on faith. And what that means is you went across America with just a backpack and a Bible and two rules. The first rule was you took no money with you. The second rule was you couldn't ask anybody for anything. So you couldn't ask for water, money, a ride, nothing. All you do is preach the gospel 10 to 12 hours every single day, and God provided in some way. And there was, there was awesome times because the Lord... He comes through like he's God, and he can keep you. He's real, like he's that real. It took me seven months to go across America. I didn't know anybody across America. I'm from L.A. Like, I didn't know anybody. I started in Detroit. I didn't know anybody in Detroit. And so I went across America with a backpack. But there was times that were just amazing, glorious times where you stayed we stayed, you know, in like super mansions, like rich people's houses, and we ate huge steaks, and it was awesome. It was great, yeah. But there was also times where you had nothing, and you preached your guts out, and people spit at you, and they cuss you, and they tell you they don't want you, and it's an awful time, and you're hungry, and you're thirsty, and you're sweaty, and you smell bad, and you ha- guess what? You have to sleep outside. The worst times is when you meet awesome Christian believers, and they know you, and they know your ministry, they know what ministry you're part of, and yet they do nothing. You come to a service and they're like, oh, these guys are awesome. 
They'll come tell us some testimonies. But after the service is over, not even water. And then you got to leave that place and keep your heart right. But you know what keeps you through those moments? You know what kept me through those moments? The gospel. I like to say, like, I want to mess with your theology and say that the gospel is a prosperity gospel. Why? Because when I had a debt so great that I could myself never pay it, he paid it for me. And guess what? Everything he did after that was all gravy. He didn't have to do it. You know angels sinned? Angels sinned against God. Hebrews says angels were a little bit higher than humans. Is there a, there's no redemption for them. None. But he chose to give us redemption when we sin. So if he never answers another prayer, if I never felt the goosebumps at a concert, if he never gave me anything ever again, he's already done more than I could have ever asked for. He didn't just give me heaven but right relationship with himself. I need the gospel every day because it gives me the right perspective on life. Because I'm human, man. And I want to go over here and I want to do this and I want to feel good and I want to have stuff and I want to show off and I want people to know my name and I like lights, I like microphones. I like notoriety. I like it when people pat me on the back and call me rabbi. But the gospel keeps it all in perspective. So when I preach the gospel to myself, I realize it's not about me. The third point is you never outgrow the gospel. There will never be a time where You've done that. I done did that. I prayed the prayer. See, the gospel is not the ABCs of the kingdom of God. It's not the door by which you get in. It is the kingdom of God. It is everything. There is no further revelation. The gospel is all of it. You can go deep in the gospel, trust me. You can preach the gospel every single sermon you do, and you'll find something good and something beautiful in there. There's none, none of this new revelation, new knowledge. The gospel is all of it. You'll never outgrow it. You'll never be too mature for the gospel. I want to do something just to drive this in real deep. I want you guys to close your eyes. Trust me. Just trust me. Close your eyes. I want you to picture this in your imagination. I want you to picture yourself in heaven. And you look to your left and there's billions upon billions of people, every color, every nation. And you look to your right and there's billions, billions of people, every dialect, every tongue. And you look at this, you look up and there's Thousands of angels, thousands upon thousands of angels flying and hovering everywhere, beautiful, white. And you look in front of you and you see the throne of God. And you see God the Father, and he's behind impenetrable light. And at his right hand is Jesus. Picture this in your imagination. You see Jesus at his right hand. You see him sitting there at the right hand of the Father. Picture this. All of a sudden, Jesus stands to his feet and he raises his hand. And all of heaven goes silent. Picture this. All the angels roar and they sing and they're, wow, Jesus, he's so beautiful. He's amazing. 
He's holy. But every human in the place is silent. Because as you look up at his hand, your eye catches a glimpse of the hole made by the nail. And you realize in that moment that the only reason you get to stand here is because of what he did. You never outgrow the gospel. Jesus is everything. You know, the Bible, it, it's got tons of stories in it about, about the gospel. And a lot of them are just, you know, different ways and different aspects to view the gospel. Just like our lives, you know, we all have a story with the Lord, a redemptive story. But there's one story in there that I really feel like really highlights the gospel to me. And that's the, the story of Barabbas. Is that, is that how you say it? Barabbas? 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 Right? You guys know that story? So if you know that story, you know like Pilate, they brought Jesus to Pilate and they're like, oh, this guy's done all this awful stuff. But Pilate thought Jesus was a good guy. And he was like, well, I don't know, you know, and my wife's having dreams about him. I, I don't know about, you know, this Jesus guy. So in the Rodrigo abbreviated version, Pilate's like, oh, I, get, I, I know what I'll do. Every single, um, on, on a holiday of the Jewish people, they had, um, they would let go a prisoner, right? That, that was their custom. They would let go of one prisoner. So Pilate was like, okay, this is what I'll do. I'll put Jesus against the worst of the worst. And I'll tell them, okay, choose one of these. And they'll totally pick Jesus. Like, why wouldn't they pick Jesus? Of course they're going to pick Jesus. Right? So that's what he does. So it comes the holy day, everybody's there. And then the pilot brings out Barabbas and Jesus. And he's like, okay, I'm going to set one of these two free. Who do you want me to set free? Super awesome, cool Jesus? Or dirty, nasty Barabbas? Right? Like, who do you want to set free? Jesus. He goes around healing people, raising people from the dead. Super nice guy. He gives people fish sandwiches. <laughs> or Barabbas, right? Right? Because he broke the bread and the fish. Fish sandwich. <laughs> right? Or Barabbas. Dirty, nasty Barabbas. Gangster. He's a thug. He, like, led a rebellion. He's killed people. He's a murderer. Jesus raised people from the dead. This guy's a murderer. Like, polar opposites, you know? Who would you let go free? And then, you know what the people say? What do they say? Crucify Jesus, free Barabbas. That's crazy. You want this guy to come back into the community? That's crazy. Like a mass murderer. You're like, oh, yeah, crucify Jesus and free the mass murderer. That's crazy. So one time I'm reading this in the Bible, and I was like, this is, yo, this is so crazy. I was like, God, like, you know, like, I was, I was like, I wonder what God the Father is, like, thinking in this moment, you know? Like, he's, there's his precious son, Jesus, and everybody's screaming, oh, kill Jesus. Like, just angry and just hateful towards Jesus, you know? And it just, like, dawned on me. Like, this is God's plan. This is God's plan. To, let, to have Jesus, his son, his precious, beautiful, sinless son die so that dirty, nasty, thug Barabbas can be let go free. I was like, What? This is crazy. This is the craziest thing I ever heard in my whole life. How does this make sense? I'll take it a step further for you. Barabbas doesn't even look back and say, yo, thanks, Jesus, peace. Good looking out. 
Nothing. Have you ever read the gospel according to Barabbas? It doesn't <laughs> exist. <laughs> it doesn't. You never hear all oh, Barabbas and, and Paul went to Macedonia to preach the gospel. No, never. He literally has like this one story. You can never hear from him ever again in the Bible. He never comes out again in the Bible. So I'm sitting there like, are you serious? Like this dude doesn't even turn to Jesus. Doesn't even say, hey, I'm sorry for what I did, Jesus. I know that you're a righteous man. He doesn't, like, for real, so. He doesn't even, like, no, no, I'll take the punishment. Let Jesus go free. He's righteous. He's, he's amazing. I've done bad things. No, no, nothing. Isn't that crazy? And this is God's plan. I'm sitting there thinking, like, whoa, this is God's plan. This dude doesn't even do anything for him. Because we like to say, you know, we like to sing the song, Reckless Love, and it's awesome, and yeah, overwhelming, reckless love of God, you know. And we, 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 we think, oh, well, God, Jesus would leave the 99 for the one. But Jesus would leave the 99 for the none. Because Jesus came and he died on the cross, not because he knew that you were going to say yes, but to give you the opportunity he died for you to have an opportunity. He wasn't guaranteed the fact that you would do it. I mean, we, we vary on doctrines here, right? But he died to give you the opportunity. People that don't go to heaven had the opportunity to go to heaven. The dude died for an opportunity. That's crazy. He doesn't, even ex he doesn't even expect me to be like, he didn't, he didn't die for selfish things, for notoriety or knowing, oh, yeah, I'm going to get all this awesome praise from all these awesome people. Everything's going to be so cool in heaven. Everyone's going to be looking at me. No. He died for an opportunity. And you know what I realized in that moment? I am Barabbas. You're Barabbas. Let that sink in. The Bible says there's none righteous, no, not one. Not even one that seeks to be righteous. Like, apart from God coming and giving you the opportunity, you were the same way. You don't want anything to do with God. Set on your own ways. That's why when I preach the gospel, I don't preach out of the of where I see myself now. I preach out of I am Barabbas. I am this guy. I am this guy, and Jesus loved me this much. Jesus just stood there silent. Knowing in his heart, yes, I want you to free Barabbas. It's okay. I know you messed up, but I want you to go free. I know you hate me. You don't love me even right now. But I want to give you an opportunity. When you preach the gospel, there's people out there, man, and it breaks your heart. And they hate it. They hate the gospel and they hate Jesus and they'll spit in your face and they'll call you everything and they'll call Jesus everything in that. But Jesus' heart is so towards them. And he looks at them and he says, I died for you. Even though you don't want me. Even though you don't care. That's the God you serve. You know, the gospel isn't just, hey, Jesus came and he set you free, although it is. 
Jesus came and he set you free from bondage. That's the gospel, but that's not all of the gospel. Because he did more than that with his blood. Jesus came and he paid for you to get out of bondage. But he also gave you the, uh, the power to overcome the problem. And the problem is sin. He came and he got you out of jail and he gave you the power never to go back. That's what he did for you. But he didn't stop there. You know what else he did? He gave you access to God the Father. This is the gospel. Jesus came, he paid the price for you to get out of jail if you accept him, if you accept that, for you to overcome sin and for you to have access to God the Father, which you didn't have before because of your sin. But he didn't stop there. Through Jesus, you don't just have access to the Father. You're a son and a daughter. You're an heir. This is the gospel. I'm explaining it to you right now. This is the gospel. He got you out. He gave you the power to overcome. He gave you access to God. And now you're fa family. You're family now. But he didn't stop there. He gave you a mission. He came, he got you out. He gave you the power to overcome. He gave you access to God the Father. You're a child now. But it doesn't stop there. You don't get to just sit in your childhoodness at home. He gave you a mission. And what is that mission? Go, preach the gospel, make disciples. That's the mission. But guess what? He doesn't stop there. That is the best part. He says, this is a tough job. It is. Every single person in here, if you're timid about preaching the gospel, this is going to help you. He knows it's a tough job. He knows that you're timid. And guess what? He totally babies you. He's like, I'm going to live inside of you, and I'll go with you. Isn't that awesome? Yeah. Yeah, he set you free, gave you the power to overcome, gave you access to God. You're a child. You have a mission, but he goes with you. And guess what you are? You're a representative of Jesus now. Guess who rep Look, let me just free you from the expectations. Who represents Jesus really, really well? Jesus. Jesus is the best representation of Jesus there is. And guess who lives in you? Jesus. God lives in you. So now you get to go out and share God with people. That's amazing. This is, this is it. Like, this is what you were created for. If you've been looking your whole life, trust me, everything else is less than this. Your good job, your doctorate, your fame, less than this. Jesus gave you a mission, and he's coming with you to fulfill that mission. Isn't that amazing? This is the gospel. This is how I would explain the gospel to somebody, all right? How I would explain it is heaven is, if you believe in heaven, tons of religions do. Heaven is a place of 100% goodness, right? What would happen if a place that's 100% good let me in? I have some, let's say I have 1% evil, which I don't. I probably have more, but amen. Work in progress, right? Say I have 1% evil and heaven lets me in. What happens to that place of 100% goodness? It's diluted by me. All of a sudden, it's not 100% good anymore. Right? So how do I get rid of my evilness? Well, there's nothing I can do to get rid of my own evilness. And God, the God who sits in the place, in the throne of the place of 100% goodness, he knew that. He saw that you could never let go or get rid of your even 1% evilness. And so what did he do? He came out of that place of 1% goodness. He took upon himself everything that separated you, all the evilness that separated you from that place of 100% goodness. 
He took it on himself, but this is the key. It's a transaction. He'll take your evil if you take all of his good. You have to make that transaction with him. It's a life for a life. So now he dies the death that you deserved. All the evil dies. And you live the good life that he deserved to live. Are you ready for that? Are you willing to, to accept that? That's a simple way to preach the gospel. And I, I, I'm going to go into a different section, a more, you know, practical section. But I want you to study, like, those Bible verses and ask God and say, how can I share the gospel? What's a good way for me to share the gospel? What's a simple thing that I can tell people that will show them the love of God and, and the reality of turning away from their old life. Just encourage you to do that. Just do that. Just think about it. Mull it over. So how do you know who you should talk to? Everybody. Amen. That's a good one. Way number one to know who you should talk to, and these are the practical things, is they talk to you first. Isn't that super spiritual? <laughs> so if someone talks to you first, you're out. I mean, think about it. You're out there, and you're doing Love San Francisco, and you're there with a group, and you're walking the streets. All of a sudden, comes, someone comes up to you, and they're like, hey, man, how you doing tonight? That's, yeah, that person. Talk to them. That's a sign. <laughs> Number two is eye contact. So... I mean, especially nowadays where everybody's on their phone, everybody, everywhere, with headphones on. So if someone gives you eye contact and, like, you'll know, you know that, you know that you know. Like, you're just like, oh, hey. And they're just like, that person is being attracted towards you because of the light that's inside of you. The Bible says that the eyes are the windows to the soul. And everybody in here, in their soul, in their spirit, has the light of the world. And even though they may not know it, that's what they're being attracted to. Christ in you, the hope of glory, and they know they need hope. The next thing is a witness of the Spirit. And some of us, you know, we, we do this a lot, and so you feel like, hey, I think I should talk to that person. Like, there's like, just like a knowing where someone walks by and you're like, I think, this, I think this is the person I'm supposed to talk to. And that'll grow, you know, as you go along. And the last thing is circumstance. So if you go to a restaurant and the waitress is there, totally share the gospel with her, you know? I can't tell you how many times I share the gospel with waitresses. And it's like totally the Lord, like they need, everybody needs it. Like they do. Also, like, you know, you're being mindful of their time and the fact that they're working. You're going to give them a really nice tip also. Or you're, you're in a plane and you're stuck with somebody. Or you're on, on the transit. You're on public transportation going to your outreach. You're sitting next to somebody. Guess what? God is sovereign. So I can't tell you how many times I sit next to somebody, start talking to them, and they're like, you know, I miss my bus. I never miss my bus. But all of a sudden today, I was just rushing, and I missed it. And that's the only reason why I'm here. It's like, what? That's God. Like, God knew, God knows you're going to be on there, and he's prepared people in their hearts and circumstances to be there because he's sovereign. He is. The next thing is, how do you actually engage somebody? Like, so how do you actually start a conversation? This is, like, the hardest part for for us when we start. It's like, well, how do I actually do it, though, you know? I see the person. I think it's them. What do I do now? So the first thing is, super spiritual again, be friendly. Whoa. Yeah. Isn't that a shocker? Just be friendly. Like, how many people do you know that are friendly? Probably just like a handful of people. Like, People don't normally get a smile, like a smile like, hey, how are you today? Whoa, you want to know about me? Like, I don't even know you, and you want to know how my day's going? A smile goes a really long way. 
It does. Because people don't get them that much. Especially now we're busy, 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 busy. We're just going place to place, thing to thing. Oh, what's my next thing? I'm, I'm late. I got to go to this thing. And people don't interact. So give people that interaction. The next thing is use open lines. This is what we call casting a net. And you just say anything. Like you see something, you say it, you know? Like, hey, man, I like your shirt. Where'd you get it? And they're like, oh, I got it this place. And you're like, oh, I shop there all the time. You know, I got my purse there. Well, I don't have a purse, but you know what I'm saying. If you're a girl, <laughs> it's a men purse. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And then all of a sudden, you just start connecting, and then that turns into the, a gospel conversation. Because out of the, the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Right? We all love Jesus in here. And so at some point, it's going to turn into a gospel conversation. The next thing is meet a need. Meeting a need is, like, super easy. Everybody in here can do that. And I want to encourage you, like, always, always meet needs when, you know, it's like a less fortunate person. That's amazing. Do it all the time as much as you can. But I want to encourage you to, meet a, to, to buy coffee for a peer, someone that you see as a peer. So say at this, you know, Love SF, you're going out, even in your life, and you're having coffee at, Star, uh, what is it here? What's the coffee place here? Phil's? Pete's, right? You're buying a coffee, and you're like, I'll get theirs too, the next person in line. And then you don't even say nothing because you're too cool, you know what I'm saying? And I'll get theirs too, and you swipe your card, and you walk over here waiting for your coffee because you're cool. And then guess what? They're going to come up to you, and they're going to be like, why would you do that? Why would you buy me that coffee? Yeah, super easy. And it's a great way to engage people. Because trust me, if you buy me lunch, I'll talk to you. <laughs> Especially if it's pizza. If you buy me pizza, bro, it's my love language. <laughs> I was just joking. <laughs> Number four is a uh, natural connection. And it's super easy, too. Like, you see somebody, they're wearing, like, your favorite sports team's T-shirt, jersey. And you know all the stats because you're, you're like that. You know what I'm saying? You go up to them, you start talking to them about that. You guys become friends. That's why people watch sports. Why do you think people watch sports? Because there's a community there. That's what you talk about. You have a, a talking point with people. Oh, did you see the World Series? Oh, my team won. You know what I'm saying? That'll start up a conversation. Once you have that connection with that person, then you can go anywhere from there. You can go into the gospel. Isn't this easy? Doesn't this seem easy? Yeah. Number five is the direct approach, and this is normally what I do, um, is I'll just go up to somebody and I'll just be like, hey, I'm out here doing something called Love San Francisco, and I'm here with my friends, and we're sharing about Jesus. Have you ever heard about Jesus? And they're like, yeah. And you're like, have you ever heard the gospel? And they're like, well, I think I went to a church one time. And you're like, can I share it with you? And they're like, yeah, sure. And you just share it. Yeah. But here's, here's the thing, though. I've been to tons of college campuses, and you ask somebody, do you know Jesus? And they'll say no, literally. We were at a campus one time, and I was like, hey, man, do you know Jesus? And this guy was like, no, who is that? And I was like, you know Jesus. Jesus, like, God. And he was like, he was literally like, what do you mean? Like, what do you mean, Jesus, God? I don't get it. And they're like, he never heard the gospel, ever. Isn't that crazy? That's why it's always good. Always, every single interaction you have, at the end, of course, if you have grace for it, share the gospel. The gospel is the thing you're there to do. Like, you're there to share the gospel in love. Amen. The next thing is one-minute one witness, and this works really well. So the one-minute witness is you basically ask somebody, hey, what's the, what's the greatest thing that's ever happened to you? So you're like, hey, what's the greatest thing that's ever happened to you? And they're like, oh, you know, I went to Hawaii with my friends. We got drunk, and we went sailing and snorkeling, and it was awesome. And then at the end, guess what? They're going to ask you, what's the greatest thing that's ever happened to you? And then you're like, well, 
Jesus. And then they're going to be like, oh, shoot, and I'm here, like, talking about getting drunk. <laughs> this guy's all spiritual. Like, it gets people. They're like, whoa, you weren't in deep, didn't you? They literally say that every time. That's a good one. The next one is ask a question. You can ask people any question. You can be like, hey, man, what's your story? What's your day like? Tell me about yourself. Any question really opens up the door. Because guess what? There's something we call the ministry of listening, and that's what we, this is our main tactic on sharing the gospel, and that's listening. Like, you have the answer, and the answer is Jesus, but to get there, you got to listen. You got to just sit there and listen and be interested in them. Like, not just like listening like, okay, when are you going to be quiet? Well, okay, let me share something with you. We're not there to get another notch in our belt. And we're not there to get another cool testimony. We're not there to come back and be like, oh, yeah, I got 10 people saved. That's not what we're going out for. If that happens, amen. But that's not our aim. Our aim is to be a step in someone's spiritual journey with God. Because it didn't happen day to night for you. And it won't happen day to night just for everybody. Sometimes God will bless you and you'll be there in that moment. But a lot of times it's just another step. They thought Christianity was awful. Every Christian they ever met in their whole life was awful. Then you come and you show them love. You sit with them. You talk to them. All of a sudden, oh, well, maybe all Christians aren't that bad. That's a step closer. That's what we're there for. We're there to make friends and show them the reality of God and how much he really actually loves them. So if you go out on this outreach and you only talk to one person, amen. Spend that time with that person. Don't just go to the next and the next one. I see people do that. Hey, man, you want to give your life to Jesus? No. Hey, man, you want to give your life to Jesus? And the person's still talking. Hey, man, you... You know, it's just like next, 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 next. That's not what we're here for. We're here to love on people. And that's what makes it easy. Because you know how to love. Each and every one of you know how to love. You know, one time, I, Savannah and I, if you know Savannah, Savannah and I walked into a party, like total just rager party in Detroit. And we just like walked in. It was like 2 a.m. Everybody in there was drinking and stuff. And we just start telling people about the gospel. We're telling people about the gospel. And, I mean, no joke, they were, like, sobering up. They were like, bro, you're killing my buzz. And we're like, we're praying for them. And some of them were, like, receiving Jesus. Like, we preach, like, the severity, you know, like, this is what it actually means to follow Jesus. It means that you give up your whole entire life. Like, whatever he asks you to do, that's what you do. Whatever the Bible says to do, that's what you do. Whatever that means. You give it all to God. Your sexuality, your preferences, your comfort, all of it. And whatever he gives you back, you run with. So we're in there preaching the gospel. And people are kids, these young guys are getting saved. And they're like bringing other ones. And they're just like, pray for my friend, pray for my friend. You know? And we're in there praying. And then this guy just gets in my face, just straight up comes straight into my face, and he just starts going off. He's like, how dare you come here and preach, preach your God. I don't believe in your God. Your God's not real. Your God's not the real God. He's just like in my face. He's just cussing me out. His friends are holding him back. It's just like crazy. And I'm like, oh, no. You know, he's like, how dare you come in my house? This is my house. It's just like crazy, you know. Don't go into a house uninvited. That's wisdom. <laughs> but, but hey, man, we were there. <laughs> and so and this guy's just cussing me. He's, you know, spitting at me, all of it. And I was just like, I love you, man. Jesus loves you. That's all I said. 45 minutes. He just, like, kept screaming at me, just in my face, super angry. And I was like, hey, man, I love you. Jesus loves you. That's all I said. But I heard him out, his whole thing, for 45 minutes. 
after 45 minutes, he literally just flops, just melts into this chair. And he says, tell me what you came here to tell me. Yeah. Like it works. He just listened. So I get down on one knee and I look him straight in the eyes. And I share about the hope in Jesus. I just share my testimony with him. How I used to be an atheist. And how Jesus interrupted my life and showed himself to be true and real. And how he's never disappointed me ever. Not once. And so all his friends come around and they grab him and they pick him up and they're like, let's pray for him. So they're all going, we're in a circle. They're all going one by one praying for him. And then it gets to him. These guys are drunk, you know? <laughs> Just like an hour ago. Now they're praying for their friend, and it gets to him, and he starts just crying out. He's like, God, God, if Jesus is the real way, show me the way. God, if Jesus is the real way, show me the way. And he says, if Allah is false, show me the truth. And so I'm, st I'm standing next to him, and I just pray the super simple prayer. I say, Holy Spirit. Would you show him the reality of Jesus? And he just starts crying. He's screaming. He's holding us so tight like our faces are squished together. Yeah, it's real snot everywhere. Everyone's crying. It's just sweat, just sweating on everybody. It's just the real thing, you know? And then he keep talking afterwards, you know? And we're about to leave. And we're leaving in... He runs up to me. He's like, Rodrigo, Rodrigo. And I turn back, and he comes. He hugs me. And he's like, you know, I just feel like you guys just came for me. You guys are like angels. And God sent you just for me. And I just like, I just like sense something deeper there. So I was like, what do you mean? You know, what do you mean by that? And he was like, tonight was my last party. You see, I threw it as my last party. I wrote a letter, and I was going to kill myself after the night. But you guys came. God sent you like angels. It just broke me, man. And I'm almost done, but before you came in here, you didn't know my name. Because I'm a nobody. I didn't come to tell you some cool stories. So you could think, oh man, there's an anointed guy. I'm just a regular guy just like you. But by the grace of God, when we preach the gospel, things happen. By the foolishness, preaching the gospel, things happen. It's not me, so don't don't look at me and say, oh man, that guy, he was so funny and he had some cool stories. <laughs> but look at me and say, hey, that guy can do it, I can do it. I can do this. You didn't know my name before you walked in. So don't walk out acting like I'm a somebody because I'm a nobody. Walk out encouraged, thinking, I can do this. If that guy can do it, I can do this. I'm not better than you. I don't have more of the Spirit than you. Nobody does. The Bible says God gives His Spirit without holding any of it back. None of it. You didn't get a junior Holy Spirit. You got all of it. And that's all you need. Raise your hand if God lives in you. That's all you're qualified. You are qualified. That's all you need. I just want you to be encouraged, man. Jesus lives in you, and that's all you need. Amen? Yeah, let's do this. So I'll briefly share the gospel again, 
you're going to pair up teams of twos. So why don't you pair up right now in teams of twos? I'll share the gospel, and then you'll share the gospel with each other for like two minutes. The gospel is this. Super simple. Jesus came to the earth. He lived a sinless life. He died to pay for your sins. He rose again and is seated at the right hand of the Father. The only way you make it in to heaven is by accepting what Jesus did and taking your sins. But you need to make an inner, you need to make a transaction with him. He takes your sin, you take his holy life. Okay, you cannot continue in your old life once you've accepted Jesus in your heart. Now you must do your best to live up to his standard. And he will help you because he will come and live inside of you. Okay? Let me explain it to you another way. Sin brings separation. If I have a neighbor and then my neighbor always lets me borrow his lawnmower and then one day I steal his lawnmower, guess what happens? Well, there's a separation in our relationship. Because he's thinking, I'm a nice guy. I always let you borrow the lawnmower. Why would you steal it? Now there's a separation in our relationship. How can I make that relationship right? I have to repent about what I did and make that thing right. So that there's not a separation anymore in our relationship. That's what happens to us in God. We chose sin. Now there's a separation between us and God. Jesus came and he paid the price because the price was too high for you to make amends. He paid the price. Now you must go to God and repent and say, I am sorry for the way I live my life. I want to live the life the way you want me to live my life. And that way you come back into right relationship.